welcome to The Code Tray, the podcast of the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMEDPRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the Libraries Entry section of the ACCP Communities website. So now for our second presentation, we have Madison Wyckoff, who is a PGY-1 pharmacy resident at Ohio Health Grant Medical Center. She will be presenting a journal club on liberal or restrictive transfusion strategy in patients with traumatic brain injury. While this topic is not focused on pharmacologic therapy specifically, I chose this journal article because as pharmacists, especially in the emergency medicine setting, we are expected to be knowledgeable in all areas of the treatment pathway for our patients. We may not be directly involved in making the decision on when to give blood or not. However, it is important for us to anticipate what will be expected next and how our patient's treatment pathways will proceed. So some objectives for today, we're going to review the pathophysiology of traumatic brain injury, evaluate previous literature, and assess current guideline recommendations, and analyze a recent trial that addresses red blood cell transfusion in the traumatic brain injury population. When TBI occurs, damages of neuronal path tissues fall into two categories, the primary injury, which is the initial insult caused by a mechanical force, and the secondary injuries, which are those that develop from the biochemical, cellular, and physiological changes from the primary injury. These changes can occur for hours to years after the initial insult and can have great consequences to an individual's quality of life. Brain oxygenation is dependent on the oxygen content in arterial blood, cerebral blood flow, and metabolic activity of the brain. When cerebral oxygen demand is outweighed by the supply, hypoxia occurs, which can result in worse worse patient outcomes associated with ischemia and brain cell death. Red blood cell transfusions can allow for increased oxygen content in the arterial blood and increased oxygen perfusion, resulting in improved brain oxygenation. Traditionally, a restrictive strategy has been utilized in traumatic brain injury patients. However, it has been hypothesized that transfusing red blood cells sooner in a liberal strategy could result in increasing brain oxygenation sooner, leading to better patient outcomes. Studies have evaluated restrictive versus liberal transfusion strategies previously. However, very few have assessed transfusion strategies in the traumatic brain injury population. The TRIC trial is a landmark trial that defined a restrictive red blood cell transfusion strategy as the standard for critically ill patients. While the population were critically ill, there was a subgroup of the population who had a closed head injury. A subgroup analysis was performed in this population with the goal of determining which transfusion strategy is superior for this subset of critically ill patients. An additional study regarding red blood cell transfusion and traumatic brain injury patients was the effect of erythropoietin and transfusion threshold on neurological recovery after traumatic brain injury, which aimed to determine if there was a difference in transfusion strategy preference. So first I'll talk about the TRIC trial. This is a multi-centered randomized control trial with 838 patients who are greater than or equal to 16 years old, admitted to an ICU with an expected stay of greater than 24 hours with a hemoglobin concentration of nine grams per deciliter or less within 72 hours, and were considered to be euvolemic. One-to-one randomization assigned 420 patients to receive the liberal transfusion strategy, which was less than or equal to 10 grams per deciliter threshold, and 418 to receive the restrictive transfusion strategy, which was less than or equal to 7 grams per deciliter. The primary outcome was death from all causes 30 days after randomization. 18.7% of patients in the restrictive strategy group and 23.3% of patients in the liberal strategy group had died with a p-value of 0.11. The conclusion from this study was that a restrictive strategy and red cell transfusion is as at least as effective as the liberal transfusion strategy. Next is the subgroup analysis. So 67 patients from the TRIC trial had sustained a closed head injury with a hemoglobin of less than nine grams per deciliter within 72 hours. One-to-one randomization occurred in this population as well with 29 patients assigned to the restrictive transfusion strategy and 38 patients to the liberal transfusion strategy. Results, primary outcome was also a 30-day all-cause mortality rates with 17% 
in the restrictive group and 13% in the liberal group experiencing death with a p-value of 0.64. The number of units transfused per patient was 4.6 plus or minus 2.5 in the liberal group and 1.4 plus or minus 2.2 in the restrictive group. So in this population, the liberal group got a considerable amount more blood product with a p-value of 0.0001. Conclusion was that there were no significant improvements in mortality with a liberal transfusion. However, due to the small sample size and limitations of the secondary analysis, this study lacks power to draw any firm conclusions. And lastly is the effect of erythropoietin and transfusion threshold in neurological recovery after traumatic brain injury. The objective was to compare the effects of erythropoietin and two hemoglobin transfusion thresholds on neurological recovery after TBI. The hypothesis was that the benefit of maintaining a hemoglobin concentration of 10 grams per deciliter would exceed the risk of transfusions required and neurological outcome would be improved. The intervention wanted to separately compare erythropoietin versus placebo, which was saline in this case, and if erythropoietin would fail to improve favorable outcome by 20%, and whether a hemoglobin greater than or equal to seven or greater than or equal to 10 would increase favorable outcomes. So this is a factorial design randomized control trial. 200 patients with a closed head injury were, who were unable to follow commands from two U.S. level one trauma centers were enrolled within six hours from injury. 91 patients were assigned to the restrictive threshold and 101 to the liberal. 102 patients were assigned to the erythropoietin and 98 to placebo. The results were the Glasgow outcome scale dichotomized as favorable and unfavorable at six months. Treatment with erythropoietin was not significant. 42.5% of patients in the greater than or equal to seven gram per deciliter versus 33% in the greater than 10 grams per deciliter recovered to favorable outcome. The conclusion was that neither the administration of erythropoietin nor maintaining hemoglobin concentration greater than or equal to 10 resulted in improved neurological outcome at six months. The guidelines available are lacking in the recommendations on if a restrictive or liberal transfusion strategy should be utilized in traumatic brain injury patients. The Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines do not address when red blood cell transfusion is indicated. The East Practice Management guidelines recommend a restrictive strategy of red blood cell transfusion is as effective as a liberal transfusion in the critically ill. And the ACS TQIP guidelines recommend a hemoglobin of greater than or equal to seven grams per deciliter in patients with TBI. Getting into the study that I looked at, this is the hemoglobin transfusion threshold in traumatic brain injury optimization trial, or known as the hemotion trial. This was conducted at 34 trauma centers with specialized neurocritical care units in Canada, the United Kingdom, France, and Brazil. This was conducted from September 1st, 2017 through April 13th, 2023. This was a prospective randomized open-blinded endpoint trial design with a hypothesis that a liberal transfusion strategy would result in better patient outcomes. For inclusion criteria, eight um, patients were 18 years of age or older, had a moderate or severe traumatic brain injury, uh, which is defined by a GCS score. So moderate was nine to 12 and severe was three to eight and who had anemia, which was defined as a hemoglobin level of less than or equal to 10 grams per deciliter. Exclusion criteria, patients were excluded if they received transfusion after ICU admission, had a GCS of three with fixed pupils, were brain dead, were bleeding with hemorrhagic shock or required emergency surgery, had a life-sustaining therapy chosen to be withheld, and had a contraindication or objection to blood products. 742 patients went, underwent one-to-one -one randomization which delegated the 369 patients to the liberal transfusion group, which was less than or equal to 10 grams per deciliter, and 300, 367 patients in the restrictive transfusion group, which was less than or equal to 7 grams per deciliter. Patients received leukoreduced red cells one unit at a time when the specific hemoglobin threshold was met. Additional units were transfused when hemoglobin levels measured as a part of routine care met the specified threshold. In both groups, the goal was to transfuse red blood cells three hours after the threshold was reached. For our outcomes, the primary outcome was an unfavorable outcome, which was a yes or no answer at six months assessed with the Glasgow outcome scale extended. Secondary outcomes were mortality, functional independence, quality of life, and depression at six months. 
tertiary outcomes with the number of units of red blood cells transfused in the ICU, lowest daily hemoglobin level, infection, duration of mechanical ventilation, and length of stay in the ICU or hospital. So how our primary outcome was analyzed, they used the Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended, which is an ordinary scale from one to eight, one being death and eight being returning to normal functioning. An unfavorable outcome was defined by using a sliding dichotomy of the GASI according to the prognosis of each patient at baseline. Patients were categorized into one of three risk levels, which was worst, intermediate, and best prognosis, and were considered to have an unfavorable outcome if the GASI score at six months was less than or equal to three, four, or five, respectively. So for example, with the worst prognosis group, if a patient had a score less than or equal to three, they were considered to have a poor prognosis. Secondary outcome measurements use different um, tests and instruments. So functional independence was used, uh, measured using the functional independence measure instrument, which evaluates the uh, amount of assistance required to perform 18 basic daily activities, each scored on a seven point scale. Final scores range from 18 to 126 with 18 as complete dependence and 126 as complete independence. The Euroqual visual analog scale in the Q-Libri questionnaire were used to assess quality of life. So the Euroqual scale was a patient self-assessment that evaluated health-related quality of life on a scale from one to, from zero to 100. And the quality of life after brain injury scale was also a patient self-assessment on a zero to 100 scale with zero being the worst and 100 being the best possible quality of life. Depression was evaluated using the PHQ-9 questionnaire, which is a nine question assessment that assesses the frequency of depression symptoms in the past two weeks for a patient and generally a score of greater than 10 indicated major depression. So baseline characteristics, our population was predominantly male, as you can see here, only 24.1% in a liberal strategy and 305 in restrictive were female. They were predominantly white and had some sort of traumatic brain injury classified as other. They mainly had extracranial injury and had a median GCS score of four. Some things I wanted to call out specifically in the baseline characteristics were that Patients in the restrictive strategy had more incidences of a GCS motor score of one, which was no movement, had no pupil reactivity, and had an incidence of hypotension and hypoxia. And we know that just one incidence of hypotension can lead to increased risk of death and poor neurological outcome. Something I wanted to call attention to here is this figure from the study, which showed the adherence to the intervention. So the median hemoglobin level during the ICU stay in the liberal group was 10.8 grams per deciliter and 8.8 grams per deciliter in the restrictive group. Patients who received at least one red blood cell transfusion were 365 patients out of 369 in their liberal group, which was 98.9%. In the restrictive group, 141 patients out of 367 received at least one blood cell, red blood cell transfusion, which is a great difference and shows how much blood product was used in the liberal versus the restrictive. For our primary outcome, um, just a reminder, this is an unfavorable outcome at six months using the dichotomized GASI score. Overall, there was no statistical significance in these results. However, the restrictive strategy did show that there was a higher unfavorable outcome at six months. And for the secondary outcome of death, once again, there was no statistical significance. However, in the liberal strategy, there was a higher incidence of death in um, the study. In the secondary outcome of functional independence, we did see some statistically significant data. However, these were large confidence intervals that did a not adjust for multiple analysis. So there's really no evidence behind these that can say that we could apply these and say that they're statistically significant. Same with the quality of life. We did see some statistically significant data. However, they also had very large confidence intervals that did not adjust. So like I talked about earlier, the liberal transfusion strategy really used a lot more blood as compared to the restrictive. So the total number of red blood cells transfused for the restrictive group was 307 units with a median number of zero units per patient. The total number of red blood cells transfused for the restrictive group was 1,516 units with a median number of three units per patient. 
The slide highlights the conservation of blood products that's experienced when a restrictive strategy is used. And for the tertiary outcome of infection, there was no statistically significant data. However, we did see a higher in incidence of pneumonia in the liberal group, and then a higher incidence of bacteremia, septic shock, or brain infection in the restrictive. There was not statistically significant data for the mechanical ventilation, ICU stay, or hospital stay. However, these parameters really highlight how sick the patient population was despite the transfusion strategy. Both groups were nearly identical in the median duration of mechanical ventilation, length of ICU stay, and hospital days. And our last tertiary outcomes were transfusion reactions. So in the liberal transfusion strategy, six out of 365 patients who received a transfusion had a reaction. Five of these patients were categorized as a severe TBI, and one of those was a moderate TBI. In the type of reaction, three patients experienced febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. JK antigen development was experienced by two patients, and there was one incident of transient hypotension. In the restrictive transfusion strategy, one person out of the 141 patients who received a transfusion experienced a reaction. This was someone with a TBI severity of severe, and this was someone who experienced hives. I did want to draw attention to this tape or this graph. The authors in the author's discussion, they utilize the figure of the Gossi scores at six months, according to group, as an argument in favor of the liberal transfusion strategy. However, the figure favors a liberal group in scores in the three to seven range. While the transfusion strategy could play a role in the difference, so could the baseline characteristics difference. Like I said, hypotension was higher in the restrictive group. So if the restrictive group had sicker patients at baseline, it could explain why they would have poor outcomes. Some strengths and limitations of the study. So strengths were that care sites varied in sizes and resources available. This is an international study. Strict protocol was monitored and enforced throughout the study, and the sliding dichotomy of the Gauss-C scale allowed for varying baseline prognosis amongst patients. Limitations were that enrolled patients had severe brain injury, outcomes relied heavily on patient questionnaires, and patients who received blood transfusions prior to random randomization were not excluded. So in patients that came in as a trauma and received blood in the trauma bay, this did not exclude them from the trial. So we really don't know how many total red blood cell units they got. And then the clinical team was aware of the treatment assignments. The author's conclusion was that a liberal transfusion strategy did not decrease the risk of an unfavorable neurological outcome at six months. My conclusion is that while arguments can be made for either side, based on the conservation of blood products and the study not proving statistical significance in favor of the liberal transfusion, I believe the restrictive strategy is the best way to manage patients with traumatic brain injuries and anemia. So clinically, how can we apply this to practice? The restrictive strategy allows for minimization of patient risk and preservation of valuable resources. So as we know, blood products are always on shortage and we really try to conserve these. So using a restrictive strategy allows us to do that. And then despite the necessity of oxygen perfusion in TBI patients, a restrictive strategy provides the same benefit as a liberal transfusion. And then the study's finding address a current gap in literature for the management of anemic patients in TBI. Um, so that concludes my presentation, and I would love to answer any questions that anybody might have. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club Presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of your journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility.
The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.